Amen. Grateful to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. And uh, also thankful for, uh, for Jameson uh, joining the, the worship team uh, this afternoon. Definitely appreciate that as well. If you would, take your Bibles and open up to the book of uh, 1 Peter. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, we'll be starting at verse 1 again. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Follow with me as I read. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Uh, why don't you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you once again for uh, the opportunity, uh, the great privilege, Lord, that we have to open up your word. Uh, Father, your, your word is rich. And uh, Father, even uh, uh, this week, Lord, looking at uh, 1 Peter, even the first verse, Lord, uh, there is so much depth, uh, Lord, even in this first verse. Uh, so Father, I pray that you would uh, be with us uh, this afternoon, Lord, that you would uh, grant me uh, strength, Lord. And uh, uh, Father, as we always come before you, Lord, asking you to open up uh, your truth to us and that you would use me as a weak instrument to be a blessing to your people, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. There was an anonymous letter that was written in the second century that described the peculiarity of Christians. And it said, Christians are not distinguished from the rest of mankind by either country, speech, or customs. They reside in their respective countries, but only as aliens. They take part in everything as citizens, but put up with everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their home, and every home a foreign land. They find themselves in the flesh, but do not live according to the flesh. They spend their days on earth, but hold citizenship in heaven. And that's an early recognition that once we are believers, once we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we become strangers even in our own home. We may live in the same country, we may speak the same language, we may share some of the same customs, but we're still foreigners. Even in the home that we live in, we may look the same, but we're not the same. In a recent message, uh, John MacArthur described some of the oddities of being a believer. He said, Christians believe in a holy law that produces complete freedom, a joyous freedom which is slavery to righteousness. Christians believe in a kingdom on earth with a capital in heaven. Christians believe in a little flock of innumerable saints. Christians believe that they are wretched outcasts who become saints. They are enemies who become sons. They are slaves who become kings. They are poor who become wealthy, they are bankrupt souls who have eternal riches, they are rebels who become friends, they are haters who become lovers, and even lovers of those who hate them. Christians believe that they are victims who become victors, they are strong who rejoice in their weakness, they are the despised who receive honor, they are souls who die once but live twice, they are mortals who become immortal, they are corrupt who become incorruptible. There are the sorrowful who have eternal joy, and all of these realities have come to us because the giver of life gave up his life so that those dead in sin would live forever. It's, it's strange to be a part of this group, isn't it? We're, we're a strange bunch of people, and some of you stranger than others, right? <laughs> in uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer in uh, John chapter 17 and verse 16, uh, Jesus said about his disciples that they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. We belong to a, a different world, a different kingdom. We have a different citizenship. So it shouldn't, shouldn't be surprising when you don't fit in. Shouldn't it be surprising? It shouldn't be surprising that you don't feel at home yet because you're not. And if the world around you finds you strange, looks at you like you're an alien, they're actually right because you are. <laughs> and back in 1 Peter chapter 1, right at the opening of this letter, Peter reminds his readers that they are scattered aliens. And that might not seem like much of a compliment on the surface, but it's part of our Christian identity. And that's the, the same way that all people, all Christians, could be identified, scattered 
aliens. Again, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens. Aliens. And some of your versions might substitute the word pilgrims or exiles, strangers or sojourners. It's the, the Greek word uh, parapidemos. It's a, a word used for those who are residing in a foreign land. It was the same Greek word uh, that was used to translate the Hebrew term for sojourner back in Genesis chapter 23. If you remember, uh, Abraham left his country of Ur of the Chaldees uh, back in Genesis chapter 11. Uh, he settled in Haran for a, for a while with his father Terah. Uh, but in Genesis chapter 12, in verse 1, when Abraham was 75 years old, the scripture says that now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 8, God said that I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. But, but listen to this. Even though God sent him to this land of Canaan, God told him that he would give to him the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. 62 years later, as Abraham's still in Canaan, so he's been living in Canaan for 62 years. At this time, he's 137 years old. His wife, Sarah, has just died at 127 years old. Abraham was seeking a place to bury his wife, and he speaks to the men of Canaan, this place that he's been living for 62 years, and listen to what he says. Genesis chapter 23 and verse 4. He says, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Even, even after 62 years in Canaan, Abraham still considered himself a sojourner. He lived there. He was buried there. He buried his wife there. But he never considered himself at home there, even after 62 years. And later on in the, the book of Hebrews, it picks up on this. If you want to flip over to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 13 with me. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Picks up on this, this language that Abraham used of himself. And in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 11, speaking about Abraham in particular, as well as the other forefathers of the faith, in verse 13, it says, All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and welcoming, having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, they would have had opportunity to return. So, so if Abraham just wanted to return to Haran or to Ur of the Chaldees to say, hey, I can feel at home there, he would have gone back. If that's what's all that it took. He says if, if, they, if they were seeking that kind of country, they, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, verse 16 says, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham was residing in a land that God said would be his, and the same is true for us. <laughs> same is true for us. We reside in a, in a place that the Lord says will be ours. And even though Abraham lived there, was buried there, buried his wife there, he still didn't think that he fit in there. I, I still don't fit in here. He was a stranger in his own home, in the home that was promised to him, and the same is true for us. I, I was reminded again of a missionary diary that I read a number of years ago by a man named David Brainerd. He was an American missionary to the Native Americans who had a particularly uh, fruitful ministry among the, the Delaware Indians uh, in New Jersey. And uh, he was born in April 20th, 1718, and died on October 9th. 1747 at the age of 29 and uh, he would often say things like this I spent the day conversing with friends yet enjoyed little satisfaction because I could find but few disposed to converse on divine and heavenly things alas what are things of this world to afford satisfaction to the soul oh that I could live in the secret pr presence of God you know so as he's talking with his friends it's just like you know, I enjoy my friends, I love my friends, but, but why do so few of them want to talk about heavenly things? I mean, I, I want to talk about where I'm really from. I mean, that's, that's where I feel home. That's, that's where I fit. I, I don't fit here on this earth. The glory of 
Christ's kingdom, he said, so much outshone the pleasure of earthly accommodations and enjoyments that they appeared comparatively nothing. And it's almost like the, the Lord was starting to free him from this life, knowing that he wouldn't be here for long. Died at 29 as a missionary and had a, a focus on heaven. That, that's where my enjoyment is. Can we, can we talk more about God? <laughs> can we talk more about Scripture? Can we talk more about things eternal? Because that's where I fit in. That's my home. We're being prepared for departure. Prepared for departure. We have souls that are fit for the kingdom of God. We've been made fit for the kingdom of God. So in relationship to the land that we're living in, we're aliens, sojourners. That's, that's our identity here on this earth. We're sojourners. But there's another term that describes our identity and relationship to the, not to the earth that we live on, but to the homeland where we're headed to. You know, from the standpoint of this earth and those around us, we're aliens. We don't fit. But there's another place that is our true homeland, and we're separated from that for a time being. So it calls those who are on the earth as those who are scattered. Those who are living as exiles. You're, you're living separately from your true home. Uh, the word scattered is a word that you might be familiar with, uh, diaspora. It's a word that was used for the scattering of the Jewish people outside of the land of promise. If you remember in uh, 722 uh, B.C., Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. 27,000 Israelites were exiled, displaced from their land, just as Scripture predicted what happened in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 23. It says, so Israel was carried away into exile from their own land to Assyria until this day. And then the southern kingdom of Judah fell under the domination of uh, Babylon and suffered three deportations in 605, 597, and the worst being in 586 B.C., which included the total destruction of Jerusalem. In 2 Kings chapter 25 and verse 9, it says, The king of Babylon sent the captain of his guard and burned the house of the Lord, the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Even every great house he burned with fire. The guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Then the rest of the people who were left in the city, the guard carried away into exile. Displaced from their land. And the children of Israel live as scattered. The diaspora, scattered from their, their homeland. The word diaspora is, a, is actually a compound word. It's made up of the, the preposition dia, which means through, and spora, which means a sowing. Uh, so it actually indicates that the people of Israel were, were scattered like seed, you know, kind of picked up out of the bag and just thrown and tossed all over the earth, scattered through a sowing. And the book of James uses the same language to speak of a, a Jewish audience in James chapter 1. It says in the first verse, James, a bondservant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. And the dispersion was a common way to speak of uh, the, the displacement of the Jewish people. So there are some people who believe in 1 Peter where we have the same language used that we're talking about the Jewish people as well. Uh, but there's a, a couple reasons why uh, we would say that we're not talking about Jewish people here in 1 Peter. If you would, take your Bibles and look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things, and somebody told me I should wait a minute to let you get a chance to get there, but hopefully you're there. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. Futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. Uh, if these were Jewish people being described here, how could their forefathers and their way of life be described as futile? What, would you use that to describe those who have inherited the, the law of, of God and uh, have had the, the forefathers, the patriarchs that are faithful? What do you describe their way of life as futile? Look over at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 3. It says, For the time already is past, the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Again, would Jewish people be described as giving themselves over to carousing, drinking parties, abominable idolatries? And, and would the Gentiles be surprised that they didn't join them? in their abominable idolatries? The answer is no. 
It says in verse 4, In all this they're surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. That, that kind of description doesn't fit Jewish people of this day. It, it actually would have been a surprise if Jewish people did join them in their excesses of dissipation. That's what made the story of the, the prodigal son so shocking because Jewish boys weren't known for living their lives like prodigals, you know, wasting their wealth with prostitutes and eating from pig's food. That's not known for a Jewish boy. So that's what made it so shocking. This, this doesn't describe Jewish people. This isn't a reference to the Jewish people during this time to stay in a, uh, that are staying in a, in a foreign land, but it is a description of believers during the time of their stay on earth. Look back at chapter 1 and verse 17. Chapter 1 and verse 17. Listen to what he says here. Peter says, If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. It's, it's being displaced from heaven and having a temporary stay on earth. The home that we live in is our temporary residence, the, the, the earth that we live in. We have a temp- temporarily, uh, we've temporarily been exiled here on the earth. We've been scattered throughout the earth like seed for sowing. And it's a great metaphor because wherever we're scattered, uh, we're to be producing fruit, right? Uh, we're to be having an impact. Actually, the, the geographic area uh, that's described by those uh, five regions, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, back in verse 1, uh, it actually uh, covers an area that's known as Asia Minor on the uh, peninsula near the Black Sea. It's estimated that um, by one estimate, there, there would be about 300,000 square miles uh, included in all those different areas if you combine them all together. That's, that's bigger than the size of Texas, if you're wondering how big that is. Uh, and when you consider that the book of Peter was written in the early 60s, that means that roughly 30 years into church history, the message of Christianity spread so rapidly that 10,000 square miles every year were covered by the Christians. And it all began with one sermon in Jerusalem. If you flip back to Acts chapter 2 real quick, Acts chapter 2. If you remember, the the day of Pentecost was one of the three pilgrim festivals in Israel, according to Exodus 23, Exodus 34, and Deuteronomy 16. All the Jewish males were required uh, three times a year to appear uh, before the Lord in Jerusalem. And uh, the three major festivals were uh, Sukkoth, which was the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, uh, Peshach, which was the uh, Feast of Passover, and Shavuot, which was the, the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. And the Lord sovereignly designed that the Feast of Pentecost would be the time that he would pour out his Holy Spirit upon the church. Look, look at uh, Acts chapter 2, look at verse 8. It says, uh, and how is it, and this is after they're speaking in, in tongues, the church is speaking in tongues and in, in the languages of the people. Look at verse, verse 8, it says, and how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we are born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and listen to this, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, three of the, the regions that are mentioned over in 1 Peter chapter 1. Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya, around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And it was on this day of Pentecost that Peter preached Christ. In Acts chapter uh, 2 and verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. And, and at least three of the regions, like I said, are, are mentioned there that are also mentioned in First Peter. And, and from Jerusalem, they spread out. And Acts chapter 16, verse 7, uh, lets us know that um, uh, there was a, the area known as Bithynia uh, that Paul wasn't uh, able to go to. The Spirit of the Lord didn't permit him to go, uh, but that didn't mean that people didn't get there. You know, people still got to Bithynia. And uh, we know that uh, uh, Paul uh, reached Galatia, at least the southern portion of Galatia. So you have from Jerusalem this message being spread out Kind of interesting, if you look at chapter 8, how did this message spread? Look at chapter 8, look at verse 1. Speaks about Saul, who was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. Then it continues to say this, that on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. What we find is that the Lord will even use persecution 
to make sure that his message gets out. God, God will even afflict the church to make sure that his message gets out. It's that critical, it's that important that the message gets out, that he will even afflict the church. And during the time of persecution, the church spread. During this time, scattered to the four corners of the earth, the, the church was just dispersed, the diaspora of the church. And we shouldn't be surprised that as the church is scattered, as the church is found all throughout the, the world, we shouldn't be surprised that the, the world will eventually turn against the church and even persecute the church. But it's just a sign, again, that we don't belong here in the first place. <laughs> first John 3, verse 13 says, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised at that. John 15, verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You, you, you look too much like me. <laughs> You're looking too much like me. The world hates you because of that. John 17, verse 14, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. They have my word, they're bringing my message, and the world is going to turn against them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So believer, whether you recognize it or not, you're all a minority, okay? <laughs> you're, you're all a minority group. In 1 Peter, believers are said to face suffering, sorrow, slander, evil, insults, maligning, intimidation, reviling, the fiery ordeal. We're all part of the hated minority of Christians. And 1 Peter was a book that was preparing the saints to suffer well. The, the handwriting was already on the wall not too long before or after this book was written, a, a violent persecution broke out against the church. Uh, the book of 1 Peter is written during the early 60s A.D., during a, the reign of a madman named Nero. He was the son of a woman named Agrippina, who had Nero during her first marriage, but she later married an emperor named Claudius, who also happened to be her uncle. <laughs> and uh, when she married and had no more use for Claudius the emperor, uh, she actually had him poisoned so that she could put Nero on the throne, poisoned her husband, who was also her uncle, so she could put her 17-year-old son on the throne from a previous marriage to put him on the throne as the emperor. During his first years, it was peaceful uh, when he listened to the advisors around him, but he later deposed of his advisors and also sentenced his own mother to death by placing her on a ship that would sink it was constructed to sink. He put his own mother on a ship that was designed to sink. He was a cruel emperor who delighted in competing in races, musical competitions that were rigged so he would always win. Just, just all about himself, narcissist. Heavily taxed people, murdered his own family, murdered the upper class in order to seize their wealth. And then in 64 AD, Rome experienced one of the worst fires in history, began in the cluttered in cluttered shops around Rome. Even when the first fire was put out, it started in another location, continued to burn. And it was rumored that while Rome burned, that Nero was amusing himself, entertaining himself while he watched the fires. One historian writes that the opinion of all cast their general widespread hatred and disgust towards Nero, of causing the fire upon him. He was believed in this way to have sought for the glory of building a new city. And in fact, Nero could not, by any means, he tried to escape from the charge that the fire had been caused by his orders. He therefore turned the accusation against who? The Christians. They're, they're an easy target. They're an easy scapegoat. People already hate them. Let's, let's just direct the attack towards the Christians. And the most cruel tortures were accordingly afflicted upon the innocent. Nay, even new kinds of deaths were invented so that being covered in the skins of wild beasts... They perished from being devoured by dogs. Many while uh, were crucified or slain by the fire. Not a few were set apart for this purpose, that when the day came to a close, they should be consumed to serve for light during the night. And Nero himself offered his gardens for this spectacle. spectacle. What they would do is they would put Christians on poles and light them on fire so they could light his gardens you know, for his little parties and festivals. In this cruel way, the persecution was first manifested against the Christians. Afterwards, too, their religion was prohibited by laws which were enacted by edicts openly set forth as proclaimed unlawful to be a Christian. 
At that time, Paul and Peter were condemned to death, the former being beheaded with the sword while Peter suffered crucifixion. Both Paul and Peter had their lives ended by Nero, under Nero. But the reason Christians became an easy scapegoat for Nero is because people already held them in suspicion. There's a Roman historian named Tacitus who says that Nero fastened guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition was checked. Christians were considered cannibalistic because they referred to the body and blood of Christ. They were considered incestuous because they referred to each other as brothers and sisters and greeted them with a kiss of love. They were considered haters of humanity because they didn't join in the practice of worshiping the Roman deities. Christians don't fit in. <laughs> they just don't fit. You know, here we are worshiping our Roman deities. I mean, this is like a national festival. Why aren't the Christians here? Why can't they join in with us? Do you just have a hatred for people? Nothing but a hater. Don't fit in. Believers rejected by the society around them. First Peter recognizes that and identifies these believers as aliens, as scattered. But listen to how else Peter identifies us. He also identifies us as chosen. <laughs> we're, we're scattered, we're aliens, but in relationship to God and eternity past, you're also chosen. In this present world, you're an alien. In relationship to your future home, you're scattered, but in relationship to God, you are the chosen. Flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2 real quick. 1 Peter chapter 2. Because this is encouraging. Even though these believers may be rejected by men, they are choice and precious in the sight of God. Reference to Jesus Christ in 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 4. It says, In coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. And then listen to verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So it's through Jesus Christ that we've been chosen and we can offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. We've been chosen and we're considered precious in his sight. We may be rejected by men, but the sacrifices that we offer are accepted by God. And in chapter 2, in verse, verses 9 and 10, look at what it says here. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are the chosen, the elect of God. And isn't it sad that uh, a doctrine that was intended to bring the most comfort and encouragement to those suffering saints is the very doctrine that brings about some of the most controversy in the church today? A.W. A. Pink, who was a gifted Bible teacher and scholar, once began a sermon by saying, I'm going to speak tonight on one of the most hated doctrines of the Bible, namely that of God's sovereign election. And, and later he wrote these words, God's sovereign election is the truth most loathed and reviled by the majority of those claiming to be believers. Let it be plainly announced that salvation originated not in the will of man, but in the will of God, and loud will be the cries of indignation against such teaching. But I love what, uh, what Calvin wrote. He said this, Scripture is the school of the Holy Spirit in which nothing is omitted that is both necessary and useful to know, so nothing is taught but what is expedient to know. Therefore, we must guard against depriving believers of anything disclosed about predestination in Scripture, lest we defraud them of the blessing of their God or to accuse the Holy Spirit for having published what is in any way profitable to suppress. But if for those who are so cautious or fearful that they desire to bury predestination in order not to disturb weak souls, they accuse God indirectly of stupid thoughtlessness as if he had not foreseen the peril and openly reproaches God as if he had unadvisedly let slip something that would be hurtful to the church. Uh, the, the Bible, again, he says, is the school of the Holy Spirit. Let them teach. <laughs> let the scriptures loose, right? Let them teach. 
So let's hear what God has to say to his suffering church and not accuse the, the Spirit of God of being thoughtless or malicious. And I recognize that uh, Peter jumps into the deep end of the pool like right away, like wastes no time. First verse, there, there's no shallow end for, for Peter. And I, I know that this might raise all sorts of questions, objections, but uh, before we get there, let's just allow the text to speak for itself, all right? And to help us think through this back in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, let's just think through a series of questions, okay? A series of questions. Number one, and at the end of verse 1, it says that this group that's scattered in aliens, that they're also the chosen. They're the chosen. So number one, what does it mean to be chosen? You guys are, you guys are really going to love this. It means to be chosen. <laughs> it means to be selected. I mean, imagine that. It's the Greek word eklektos. Translated as chosen and elect. And this implies that someone else is doing the choosing. Somebody else is doing the selecting. And guess what? It's not us. What does it mean to be chosen? It means to be chosen, all right? Who's making the selection? That word chosen is an adjective here in First Peter. But who identifies believers as the chosen? Who gives that designation? Verse 2. Our election is according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. It's God the Father who's doing the choosing. Mark chapter 13, 27, and Luke 18, verse 7, calls believers his elect. Romans 8, 33 says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Colossians 3, verse 12, addresses those who have been chosen of God. Titus chapter 1 says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. Who makes the selection? God does. God does. How does the Father make his selection? Peter again says it's according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. What does that mean? It's the, the Greek word prognosis. In the, in the medical field, you know, we would, a doctor might share a prognosis, which is a, a likely course of a disease or an ailment, you know, based on his knowledge of the symptoms or uh, an examination. You know, today doctors are even doing examinations from a, a screen, uh, which uh, I'm not sure how far that's going to go and how long that's going to go, uh, but it seems like it could limit a lot of what can be done, but physicians are doing it from the screen. But he's telling you what's likely to happen. You know, this is likely what you have, likely what you're suffering with, likely your ailment. When we speak about God's prognosis, he's not describing what's likely, he's describing what is reality. What is reality? And what is a reality is God's knowledge of those who are elect. But how is that an encouragement to uh, suffering believers? And there, there are some who will say that, you know, really what this word, you know, prognosis means, you know, this, this foreknowledge that he chooses us based on foreknowledge, what this means is that, that God looks down the corridor of time. You know, he, he, he has the ability to kind of like peer into the future. You know, he's got the sight beyond sight. I can just look into the future and I can see you and that choice that you're going to make. And based on your choice, I choose you. And I look down the corridor and I say, you, oh, you do. You're making that choice. Based on your choice, I choose you. But how is that even a choice? <laughs> how is that a choice? I choose God and God, based on my, my choice, chooses me. That makes God the responder, not the initiator. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says, He predestined us to adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ to himself, listen to this, according to the kind intention of his will. It was his decision, his will. Not our will, it was his will. Romans chapter 9, verse 16, it says, So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. It's God who has mercy. It's God's not looking down the quarters of time, seeing if you'll make a choice and then respond to your choice. That's not what it is. And if God is looking down the corridor of time, is he seeing some kind of future that he's disconnected from? What kind of future is God seeing if he's not the one directing it? I mean, what, what world exists where God is not involved in everything? How is he discovering what's going to happen independent from himself? There is no future independent of God. All that comes to pass happens by the will of God. Isaiah 46, verse 10, says, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, 
saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God does whatever he wants, wherever he wants, right? (laughs) And if you want to burn a couple brain cells, think about this one for a while. Burkhoff in his systematic theology says this, out of his knowledge, God's knowledge of all things possible, he chose by an act of his perfect will, led by wise considerations, what he wanted to bring to realization and thus formed his eternal purposes. I mean, I mean, think about that. Not, not only does God know everything that is, God knows everything that could have been. <laughs> I mean, when you think about the omniscience of God, I mean, just knowing everything that is, is mind-boggling. Think about all that could have been, and God knows that as well. well I, I mean, when we're talking about God, we're talking about an infinite being. We're talking about the infinite creator. There is no reality that exists outside of God. There's nothing outside of him. There is no reality that God can conceive of that does not include his direction because there is nothing outside of his direction. Nothing outside of God. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Next question. If God were to look down some imaginary corridor to scan the mass of humanity for somebody who would respond favorably towards him, who would he find? (laughs) If if that were the case, if God could just, you know, if we could imagine that God can look down the corridor of time and just, I'm just looking for somebody who's going to respond towards me on their own. Romans chapter 10, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none righteous. Who understands? There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. The the Google search comes up empty. (laughs) Looking for a righteous person. Can't find them. Looking for somebody who's seeking for me. Doesn't exist. There is nobody who's seeking for God on their own. And God does not simply foreknow events when we talk about the foreknowledge of God, it's not like he simply foreknows events, things that will happen. What God foreknows is people, people. It's not just a decision that God foreknows. It's the individual that God foreknows. Flip over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, take a look at uh, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And this, this is an important distinction to make when we talk about the foreknowledge of God in relationship to, uh, to his election and choosing. Important distinction to make because foreknowledge in this context is personal. It's personal. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. It says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So God foreknows you. Isn't that encouraging? If you're just thinking that God just knows the future, that, that's not very encouraging. That God, Because God foreknows the believer just like he foreknows the unbeliever in that sense because God knows everything. So, so how is it encouraging that God foreknew me? How is that encouraging that he foreknew me? Both the Greek and the Hebrew words for knowledge can imply relationship. Relationship. Listen to this, Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. It's, it's the, the word of relationship. Amos chapter 3, verse 2. God speaks to Israel and says, you only have I known. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean Israel's the only? I didn't know that there was another nation that existed. Israel, I only knew about you. That's not what God is saying. What he's saying is that Israel, you're the only one that I've chosen out of the families of the earth to have a relationship with in this special way. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Adam, in the old King James, says, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. Does that mean that he knew who she was? Knew what her name was? (laughs) It means that that he had a relationship with her. Now, the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. He he had entered into a relationship with her. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus, Jesus knows who they are. He, Jesus created them. Of course he knows who everybody is. But what he's saying is I don't have a relationship with everybody. I created everybody, but I don't have a relationship with everybody. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. He has a relationship with them. And if you had any question about this relational idea from the, the word uh, for knowledge and uh, even the word for uh, prognosis, flip over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Speaking about Jesus Christ in the context here, it says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. And the, the idea here isn't that, you know, God just knew about Jesus before the I just knew who he was. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that he had a relationship with Jesus before the foundation of the world. It's a word about relationship. And here, here's the encouraging truth for these saints who are facing persecution. God the Father determined that he would have a relationship with them. You, you might be rejected by men. You might be scattered. You might be aliens for everybody else who's around you, but guess what? I have determined to have a relationship with you. You, you can find your home with me. You're, you're at home with me. John 15, verse 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. I've, I've entered into this relationship with you. And when does God the Father make this selection? The word foreknown already lets us know that it was a prior time. But we find out from the rest of Scripture that this relationship was chosen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Before the foundation of the world, he determined that he would have this relationship with us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, Beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. What kind of encouragement is that? that? That's the place, like I said, that we can finally call home. I am home in my God. I am home in my relationship with Jesus Christ. This is where I find my true identity. I'm chosen by him. I'm in him. The story is told of uh, the middle of the second century. It's during the reign of an emperor named Marcus Aulius. Christianity was illegal during this time, and believers throughout the Roman Empire faced the threat of imprisonment, torture, death. Persecution was especially intense in southern Europe, where there was a man by the name of Sanctus, who was a, a deacon from Vienna, who had been arrested and brought to trial. And the young man was repeatedly told to renounce his faith, renounce the faith that you profess. But his resolve was undeterred, and he said in reply, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. No matter the question he was asked, he was always gave the same answer. According to ancient church historian Eusebius, Sanctus girded himself against his accusers with such firmness that he would not even tell his name, his nation, his city to which he belonged, or whether he was bond or free. He answered in the Roman tongue to all the questions, I'm a Christian. When at last it became obvious that he would say nothing else, he was condemned to severe torture and a public death in the amphitheater. On the day of his execution, he was forced to run the gauntlet, subjected to wild beast, and fastened to a chair of burning iron. Throughout all of this, his accusers kept trying to break him, convinced that he, his resistance would crack under the pain of torment. But Eusebius recounted, even thus, they did not hear a word from Sanctus except the confession which he had uttered from the beginning. His dying words told of an undying commitment. His rallying cry remained constant throughout his entire trial. I am a Christian. For Sanctus, his whole identity, including his name, citizenship, social status, was found in Jesus Christ. Hence, no better answer could be given to the question that was asked. He was a Christian, and that designation said everything about him. As one historian says about the early martyrs, they would all reply to all their questions about them with a short but comprehensive answer, I'm a Christian. 
Again and again, they adhered to this brief profession of faith. The question was repeated, who are you? And they replied, I already said that I'm a Christian. And he who says that has thereby named his country, his family, his profession, and all things else beside. So my question is, who are you? (laughs) Who are you? Where do you find your identity? Your identity is is a believer. Your identity is not here. (laughs) You're, You're an alien here. You're an alien here. And heaven is your true home. Are you trying to gain your identity in reference to this temporal earth? Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I'm a Christian. Colossians 3, verse 11 says that, speaks about a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. I'm a Christian. My primary identity is not about who I am in this world. It's not about my nationality, my citizenship, my skin color, my cultural preferences, my profession, my station in life. I'm a Christian. And that's the most important thing about who I am. My most important identifying trait is that I'm a Christian. I might be able to check off a box in a lot of different areas, I'm black, I'm an American, my dad's from the South, my mom's from Jamaica, I grew up in upstate New York, I'm a father, I'm a husband, but the most important box that I can check off is that I am a Christian. I'm a Christian, and I'm an alien in this world, and I'm scattered from my home country, and I might be rejected in this world, but I am chosen by God, and I'm precious in his sight, and that's the most important thing that could be said about who I am. And I hope you believe that. I hope you believe that. I hope that's true for you. That the most important identifier for you is that I am a Christian. Everything else comes second place to that. I'm connected to my Savior. I'm connected to my true home. Heaven is my true home. We're not distinguished from the rest of mankind by our country, our speech, our customs. We reside in our respective countries, but only as aliens. We take part in everything as citizens and put up with everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is a home and every home is a foreign land. We find ourselves in the flesh, but we do not live according to the flesh. And we spend our days on earth, but we hold our citizenship in heaven. And if that's not true for you, I pray that today would be the day that you would switch citizenships. (laughs) That you would switch citizenships. That you would make heaven your true home. That you'd become a citizen of heaven. And the way that you become a citizen of that kingdom is that you repent of your sins, that you recognize your sins for what they are before a holy and a righteous God, that we've all sinned, that we've all fallen short of his glory. And Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy, has come to pay the price that we couldn't pay. He lived the righteous life, the life that we couldn't live. He died on the cross as a substitute for all who would trust in him, all who would believe in him. And if you would turn from your sins and turn from this wicked world that is perishing and say, I'm done with this life and I want the life that he offers me, the Bible says that he will give you an exchange. Your sin for his righteousness, right? God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And it's only there that you can find your true home. (laughs) Jesus is my home. The book of Colossians says that Christ is my life. That's my life. That's where I belong. That's where I find home. That's where I find rest. Amen? Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity that we've had to just crack the door to 1 Peter. Lord, there is so much more. Even in these first few verses, Lord, there's more that we didn't even touch on today. But, Father, I pray that, Lord, you would be honored, that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, Lord, and that all of us, Lord, all of of us who claim the name of Christ, that we would find in him our true identity, our most important identifying mark is that we are a Christian, that we belong to Christ, and that even though we might be exiled and we might be aliens, that we're chosen by God. In Jesus' name we praise you and give you thanks. Amen. At this time...